everybody. I'm physiotherapist Kim Siddons. It's really exciting for me to host an evening event because particularly during this coronavirus period when we haven't been able to get together traditionally face-to-face -to -face for many student, parent, teacher events in the evening, I'm so excited to be able to share a whole heap of goodness that will hopefully help you and your students set yourselves up for success at your desk. Whether you're home learning at the moment because schools are closed and you're needing to rearrange how you're doing things, not the traditional schooling you're used to, whether you always do homeschooling, or whether you've got students who do homework and home study. So even students who go to school, that is pretty typical that they will be doing their homework, their assignments, and their home study in the evening. So as I said, my name's physiotherapist Kim Siddons. I'm based in Adelaide in Australia. And a few years ago, I became really interested in the study of ergonomics because I could see a link between how people were presenting to the physio clinic with aches, pain, strain, and all sorts of sluggishness, stiffness, soreness, and how they were spending their time at home uh, for study and their time at school hunched over laptops. So particularly students were really suffering. My background is actually as a sports physiotherapist. I've done that for many years, worked with elite sporting teams and in sporting physio clinics. And after having a bit of time having my children and we moved to Adelaide, I started working in a physio clinic in the city. So my demographic changed. I wasn't any longer seeing mainly elite sports people in very controlled conditions where they had a huge support network of strength and conditioning uh, trainers, dietitians, specialised coaches, their own physiotherapists. The average everyday person that was coming in to see me didn't have 24 hour access to those support networks. They were coming in from offices around me in the city clinic and working in and also from the uh, city-based schools that were nearby. And so as these students were coming in to see me, I was starting to feel really upset because they were suffering really needlessly from really awful aches, pains and strains that could have been prevented. One girl in particular, I remember coming in to see me and it just broke my heart. She had uh, just finished uni and got into uh, the university course of her choice, high achiever, done really well. And her mum sent her to see me and when she came in, she told me about the extreme pain in her back, upper back, neck, shoulders and chronic headaches. And we started talking about it and when I asked her how long she had those headaches, neck pain, back pain, she, she said to me, Kim, I can't ever remember not being wracked by severe pain, headaches that really got in the way of my study life, my social life, and even not being able to go to school all the time. And I had to take lots and lots of painkillers. And that just shocked me. I couldn't believe that someone so young, otherwise really healthy, was, was reasonably sporty, could actually be suffering that much. And once we started just doing a little bit of work and giving her lots of simple tips and advice around her setup and how she should move and her posture, things completely turned around for her. And she went on to eventually become self-sufficient with all the self-care things that we skilled her up in. And she was able to go on to uni and as far as I know, still living a really happy, productive life and not having the same problems with her body. So that's what inspired me to start getting the word out to students and getting into schools, doing lots of workshops with students, empowering them in the things they can do. You would be surprised how many kids in a classroom and your children might be similar, will put their hands up to say that they feel aches in their back, neck, shoulders, and sometimes even headaches. And sometimes it's a lot of the time. And that's really sad because it shouldn't be their normal. And I often say to these kids, yes, it's common to have those sorts of aches and pains, but it's not normal to have it a lot of the time. And there are so many things that you can learn to do to have tricks up your sleeve, tools in your toolbox to help yourself feel amazing. 
So we talk about lots of things, not just ergonomics, but ergonomics is a big part of that. So what does ergonomics mean? It's a bit of a big fancy word. So ergonomics is really just the science of how we go about designing and setting up ourselves for our work. And we often think about it as the office situation or the desk work situation. It also means your workstation wherever you are, but we're particularly talking about the ergonomics of setting up a desk uh, today for success so that you are more productive, you're better in your brain power, you feel a lot better in your body because you're taking strain and pain off areas that otherwise can get stiff, sore and sluggish. Now, the thing to know about ergonomics is that yes, getting yourself set up well can be really helpful, but it's not a static thing. We as humans move, we're designed to move, we love movement. There's a few things we'll touch on about that. And so your work environment can change and should change. So we'll go through some basic principles about how we might set ourselves up for success tonight. But really, you can take these principles and use them in lots of day-to-day -day situations because you might not always want to be stuck in the same place if you're studying at home. So you might want to, when it's sunny, go and sit on a chair outside or you might want to move to the kitchen table or you might want to slink off into a quiet area. Sometimes our students tend to be really good at wanting to study on the floor, in their bed, in all sorts of awkward positions. We won't go necessarily into that today, but that's something I love to talk a lot with students about because once they get the idea about their posture, positioning, and how to set themselves up for success, they often start to make the best healthy choices for themselves rather than waiting on parents to nag them. But saying that, setting up a desk at home is something you can do together with your students so that they can understand a bit about the principles behind it and you can help them because let's face it, the parents or, uh, are often the ones that are helping supply the furniture or source the accessories that you might need. We really want to try and keep everything budget friendly today. You don't need to go to a huge expense but just know that ergonomics is a fluid thing. There are no strict rules so things have to really work for you, for your household, for your situation but how you like to work and how you like to study. And so make sure you uh, save some questions to the end if you want to, if there's anything burning that we haven't covered, but hopefully we'll cover off all of those little questions as we go along today. And if you've got any other specific, really tricky situations or questions that you'd like uh, further information on, then I've always got, uh, there are some definitely access to my online ergonomic assessments that I will send you links. We'll put up links for later. So let's get on to actually getting into the nitty gritty, the meaty stuff about what we're going to do. And before we go through this desk setup, I will just give a bit of a disclaimer that this is not specific advice for you. Obviously, you're watching me in my situation, and so take these principles and adapt them to yourself. Be safe and look after and think about your own body and your own situation. So the first thing we are going to do is start to look at our desk and our chair because they're their big items, their biggest ticket items. Now, I'm assuming that most of you in your home environment will probably have a fixed height desk like this one. Some people might be lucky enough to have a sit to stand workstation that can go from anywhere you know, lower than this to up to a standing height either a wind-up or an electronic one, that is fantastic. But most of us will have some sort of table or some sort of desk or some sort of bench that we're going to place our equipment on to study. We're going to put our books on, our laptop, uh, or our, have our monitor out, that sort of situation. So the first thing we do when we've got a fixed uh, table area is start to look at our chair and set up our chair. So we'll talk a little bit more about the desk in a minute, but we'll start with the chair. So you might already have an amazing office chair at home, that's fantastic. Some of you will and some of you won't. Office chairs are not all created equal. 
there are many that are better than others uh, and you do tend to get what you pay for but having said that you can get a really good office chair for under $500 it should be under $500 and still have some adjustability so what do you really need it would be great to have a padded seat so it's actually nice and comfy to sit on it would be really great to have an up down lever so you can raise and lower the height which we'll talk about in a minute you may or may not need arms that's fine and it's fantastic to have some optional extras it's great to have a seat backrest that goes up and down so mine's on a ratchet system it can go down and you can raise it to have the lumbar support in the right area for me there's lots of different mechanisms and that's fine it's just great to have one that will adjust to your back and it's great to have a chair that can slide in and out in the depth. Not many chairs do that, but I do have access to a few different types if you, you're interested in that, I can send you links. But this chair has, I'll see if you can see, a lever on the side that uh, lengthens and shortens the depth of the seat. So that means that it's, you can tailor your seat to be the right length for you. And it's really tricky with students who are not always at adult height to find the right chair. Very tricky. Some of the ones you can get at uh, Ikea that are kids chairs have a little bit of padding. Uh, the ones that have padding are better than others and some of them have an up down lever on the side. So if you've got a primary school child that might be enough for them and we'll talk about how we then modify it in a sec. But there are a couple of websites, not many, that have specific ergonomic office type or what they call them task chairs for kids to sit on. Otherwise, if you've got a teenager, many teenagers are almost big enough now to be sitting in an adult sized chair. And how would you know how to size up the chair? The best way is to sit on the chair with your bottom in the wiggle right back. I'm not sure if the lighting's good enough to see, but my bottom's right back in the chair. And when I sit on my chair, I can get two to three, can you see? two to three finger width distance clearance behind my knee, between the back of my knee and my chair. So you really want your kids to be able to be sitting in a chair where you've got uh, most of their thighs supported when you've got your bottom back in the chair and that's the key when you've got your bottom back in the chair so you want most of your thigh supported ideally two to three finger widths clear at the back so that your knees not running up against the padding of the chair that's not always possible and as i said before ergonomics is often a best case scenario we do the best we have we have with what we can find or what we have resourced if you don't have an office chair and if you don't have one that's got a uh, a seat that's shallow enough for your child, what might else you use? You might find a dining chair that's reasonably suitable for you, your child. It might not go up and down, but it might have a, an okay padding and at least it's got a firm base of support and a backrest, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It is actually important to have a backrest when you've been sitting, studying for any length of time. So there's a huge variety in chairs. I would pick the one that is most easily accessible for you and affordable for you, but it is better to have a firm chair, preferably one that goes up and down at least so you can get the height right, and we'll discuss that in a second. And even better, one that's actually got some adjustability in the backrest and the seat depth so you can make it shorter or longer, and it means that they can grow into it as well. So the older they are, the easier it is to fit your student to an office chair. The younger they are, you might end up with something that's a little bit of a compromise and you might have to even pad them up with cushions behind the back so that they can actually get their bottom right back in the back. It's a very tricky compromise for a while there where they're between that tiny, teeny chair stage and a normal adult stage. There's not many chairs around, but do the best you can. I would steer away from stools that don't have like static stools that don't have a backrest for any length of time it might be okay for a short period up at the kitchen bench while you're preparing dinner and 
kids are sitting there doing the homework and that won't be right for a while. But for any length of time, a backrest is really supportive so that they can actually sit in a really supported, great posture, which we'll talk more about in a minute, while they're actually doing any type of homework assignments, especially screen work. Now you might be thinking, what about fit ball, those Swiss ball things to sit on, or the wobbly chairs, all the different types of them, wobbly stools. Now they're again fine for a little while. Often these kids though are in a situation at home where they're doing homework and assignments after hours. So it's a bit different to if you're spending most of your day uh, home learning at home. You might even change, change your chairs around between children or for children so that you can have a variety. A variety is amazing if you can offer that. So you might have a, a bit of a fit ball or a Swiss ball that they can use for short periods or a wobbly stool for short periods and then go back and be more supportive and give you back a break. Because actually it is quite hard work to sit on those sorts of uh, balls or wobbly stools for a long period of time. And lots of uh, students just don't have the endurance in their stability muscles and then they start spending more time in a straining, pain posture. And that cumulative effect can build up. So we've talked about selecting our chair. What a long-winded answer. But it's a really complicated sort of thing to cover. So next of all, how are we going to adjust our chair? Now, I'm gathering that most of you will probably be able to find at least one office chair that you could spend some time when you're doing your home study. You would like to be able to raise the chair, usually the levers on the right hand side, raise the chair to the point that when you come into your desk like this, that your elbows are just a bit higher than your desk or around elbow height. Okay, so when I go to put my hands on the keyboard to type and come in nice and close put my bottom back in the chair, of course, that my elbows are around the top of the table height so that I'm actually not squished up like this. If you're too low, you end up typing like a Tyrannosaurus Rex like this, putting a lot of strain on your elbows. And if you're too far away, obviously that's got uh, problems because if you're too high, you tend to lean forward and lean over, and that's not great for your body either. So roughly around that elbow height, you come in nice and close, is a great height for your chair. You then want to just, depending on the adjustability that you've got, we've talked about the depth, so a couple of fingers behind the knee. If you've got adjustability in height of your backrest, you uh, place that at a height so that you've got lumbar support in this hollow of your back. Now the last thing that we need to talk about that's really common is how upright people have the back of their backrest. So you can see this newer type of chair. The backrest actually moves a little bit, which is fantastic because it encourages movement. But this backrest is also leaning back a little bit. See how it's got about a 20 degree, 15 to 20 degree recline? Now in the olden days, in early days of ergonomics, back when you know, I was first at uni, they used to teach us that sitting up straight, perfectly upright, was the right posture to have, and your backrest should be upright. And that's where the whole sit up straight comes from, sit up straight. So that was before we were spending so much more time at our desks and spending so much more time leaning forwards over screens rather than just writing and spending much more time stuck. Uh, between things so we're not moving as much. So now we've realised that people actually need to be encouraged to lean back on their backrest and guess what, a backrest is for resting your back. So we're supposed to have the backrest angled back a little bit so that we can rest our back on our backrest and take the strain of gravity off our back because we tend to sit for such long periods now, if we're just trying to hold ourselves straight, up, perfectly upright all the time, after a while, and specifically when we're looking at screen, we tend to drift off like this. And we tend to come more towards the screen, especially if we're concentrating, looking forward. So we tend to get that round shoulder, hunch back position happening that is really straining for our upper back, neck and shoulders in particular. So the antidote is, to have your backrest reclined a tiny little bit 
15, 20 degrees, whatever's comfortable for you, so that when you've got your bottom right back in the back rest, in the bottom, when you've got your bottom right back in the seat, which is where it should be most of the time, wiggle back, you can lean back on your back rest and be supported and rest your back. So we want your back rest to recline a little bit, okay? Then you're encouraged to lean back. You've got your chair now about over height, lean back and coming in to your screen. And voila, it's so much easier to keep your ears and head aligned over your shoulders, aligned over your hips. I've got much less muscle activity happening, which is stressing and straining uh, my muscles and my back and putting strain on my joints and ligaments. I'm much more supported and I can easily stay more comfortably working at my laptop, my screen, whatever setup I'm at, even my writing on books. So that is an amazing little trick with your back rest. All right, so we've got our chair pretty well set up. Now we need, next thing, to see if our feet are flat on the floor. So it is no point having your chair beautifully set up if your feet don't easily sit flat on the floor. And I wonder if you can guess why. Because if your feet aren't flat on the floor, you tend to want to do something else with them. You tend to want to cross them like this, which puts a lot of lopsided strain on your back, touch your pelvis under into a really curvy, awful position when you spend much time in it. You tend to maybe tuck your legs underneath you in the chair, maybe even sit on the leg. You tend to want to do all sorts of things with your legs, but keep them flat. So we really want, if your feet don't get flat on the floor, once you've got this desk and chair height set up right, you really need to think about a full rest. Most students, even a lot of adults, will need a foot rest to support their feet. And the reason being is when you've got a foot rest, I'll show you mine. Mine is a really sturdy, fancy one. So I'm not overly short. I'm very average in height. But when I sit my bottom back in the back rest and I'm at my desk, have my chair at the right height for my desk, my feet aren't flat on the floor. So I've got this foot rest underneath my table. And when I sit there and have my feet up at it, see how my thighs are so much better supported. When my thighs are more supported, I'm actually much more comfortable to spend more time leaning back on my back rest rather than perching on the edge of my chair. Have you ever realised when we sit down, we tend to sit at the front of our chair because we're trying to sort of get our feet flat on the floor and get more thigh support. When we've got our bottom right back in the seat, our legs are often dangling down and that's why we want to do all funny things with them because they're not comfortable. We feel like we're hanging off, hanging off this area. So having your feet up on a supportive footrest is amazing, but it doesn't have to be expensive, okay? So I've got one I use all the time, so I've lashed out and got one uh, for, for just to be over $100. It's very sturdy, I use it a lot, and we all do our calf stretches off it at home. So that's been worthwhile for us, but you can find anything around the house. Typically, a great shoebox would be quite a really good shoebox. You can get some really nice big ones for, from boots and things these days. So a big boot shoebox would be great because it's nice and sturdy. You can fit, fit both your feet on there, and that feels amazing. Or a student came up with a great idea for me the other day because we were talking about movement and movement breaks. And they said they're going to put their feet on a basketball because they're someone who needs to move a lot to feel awake and inspired and, and keep their concentration going. So they were going to use a, a basketball to lift up their feet. That was about the right height for them. They were a primary school student. And also to give get their body moving so they weren't getting some ants in their seat and nodding off so much. I thought that was a great idea. I wish I'd have thought of that. But a shoebox is fine or some stacks of books, uh, a low box. Anything that actually helps keep your feet up so that your thighs are more supported, about 90 degrees at the hips and then the knees, just try it. If you're not very tall and your feet don't always touch the floor flat on heels, try a foot rest. You will be amazed at the difference. When I go into places and give people feet rests, foot rests, they can't believe they didn't try it earlier. So that's my big tip for today. 
see if you need a footrest. All right, so we've got our chair set up, we've got our footrest if we need it, like I do, and we're coming into our desk. Now, we talked a little bit about which desks you should use, but there's really no hard, fast rules because there's lots of tables and areas around your house that might be suitable. And you can move from one to the other, as I said before, if you have a mobile workstation like I do. I've got a few options set up to show you. So I really would prefer you to have some depth in your desk because we're going to talk about in a minute how far away we have our screens. And sometimes I see people operating off really, really skinny, narrow desks and their screens are so far and they're all squished in trying to get their notebooks um, and things spread out. So having a bit of depth just gives you that little bit more play space if you can choose. If you are squished for uh, space, don't worry. You really only just need to be able to sit down and have your uh, desk as deep as the fingertips when you reach out because that's sort of roughly where you want the screen to be, which we'll get to. So you can find a space that suits you. It is great to have a bit of a quiet area so you can actually concentrate. You would love that. Um, but it's not always possible. Kitchen bench could be fine. Dining table can be fine. A great dedicated space will make it easier for you to get your chair set up right and have your stuff, that your accessories that are going to help you be set up a little bit more quick at hand. But if you have to pack it up all the time and move around, that's fine too. I've got a bit of a mobile system here that I use and I move that around the house in different places or I move it around workplaces and, and have it with me as well. So that's fine. Desk is not such a thing except for the sit to stand option. So sit to stand is amazing and I will tell you why. It's not always a, a, a sort of budget friendly option if you're not thinking you're going to use it. But the whole premise around sitting and standing is the fact that we really should move more often than we do. We really should only sit for about 20 minutes before we move. So we'll be moving in a minute. We've been sitting for a little while. And about after every 20 minutes, we really should stand. But only for about eight minutes, the research says. So Professor Alan Head in the UK is such a great researcher. He has lots of research around his little cycle of sitting, standing and moving. So he is the gold standard of recommending about 20 minutes of sitting for eight minutes of standing for two minutes of moving. So not everybody has the option to sit to stand desk. I've got a desktop one. I've just moved it down tonight so I can show you a typical setup. But I can set this up and I'll quickly show you because this one's electronic and it's going to be hard for you to see. But I stand up here at about elbow height and I will adjust the rest of that later for standing. But it makes it so much easier for me to spend a little bit of time in standing, my 8 to 10 minutes, not too long. So you don't want to be standing all the time, but you might find that you sit a bit and then you move to a higher bench at the kitchen for a little bit of a break. It's all about rotating around posture, so we're not just stuck in the one spot for any length of time. Speaking of which, now that you've probably been sitting for a little while, wherever you are, even if you're on the couch, let's just get our body moving a little bit so we don't get stiff and sore. So a few of my favourite things to do would even be just to lift one bottom cheek up and then the other. So I'm actually wiggling my bottom back in the chair, which I need to do as I go. So I'm getting my body moving and my low back's not getting so stiff. I really don't want to stiffen up. So that's easy for me to do. I'm doing it really big so you can see, but sometimes I'll be on a Zoom call and I'll be trying to keep st still from the top up and be moving my pelvis from the bottom down and giving my legs a bit of a swing in and out so that I'm keeping my circulation going, I'm not getting stiff and sore in my legs and back. The other thing that is fantastic when we're sitting at our desk is just to get our hands into a fist and do some rows to open up our chest. Oh, how good does that feel? So even if you're sitting on the couch, let's just have a little bit of a row. You might be feeling a bit tight and achy like I am at the end of today. Have you had a big work day? Because I have had a really long day on my feet at the clinic and I'm really feeling like having stretch back opening up my chest. So a few of those to really open up those tight muscles and switch on my anti slouching muscles. So as I draw back in here, you can see these ones are coming back on. And those muscles at the back of our shoulders are our pain relieving 
anti-slouching, awesome muscles that help us feel so good. Once we've done that, let's just give ourselves a little bit of a twist and a stretch. So I'm punching forwards and taking my other arm back behind me so I don't get caught. But if you pull one arm back, now if that's a bit high for you and a bit sore in your shoulder, just go lower. So I'm going to twist my trunk, bring my elbow back behind me. Again, using those anti-slouching muscles at the back and giving my shoulders a good twist. One of the things about our day-to-day -day lives, if we're not exercising and stretching out all the time, is that often a lot of things we do, whether it's sitting at a desk or preparing dinner or housework, everything seems to be down here, down shoulder, under shoulder height. We don't often um, break out of that sort of position to give our body a stretch this way or to give our body a stretch overhead. So even if we clasp our hands together, put them up and behind, if you give your hands a little bit of a lower down to the back of your, behind, or behind your shoulders, back of your neck, you might feel the stretch that I feel in terms of just getting our arms and shoulders up overhead and reversing our posture. Such simple things can make a massive difference. Now, not only is that stretching out tight muscles and improving our posture and flexibility and switching on our awesome anti-slouching muscles, but that little movement break, a couple of minutes, has just gotten our metabolism going and woken us up. I'm even puffing it a little bit because I'm talking so much while I do it. So our metabolism is keeping going, which is such a big risk factor when we sit at our desk a lot. We start to feel really weary. We start to feel really tired from sitting because our metabolism has wound down. And that movement routine we're talking about where you sit for 20, stand for 8 to 10, move for two minutes every half hour, you might feel like a bit of a yo-yo. So it's a bit tricky to get that much movement in, but that is a gold standard. And that just shows how often we're supposed to move, get our bodies going, to wake us up, to keep our metabolism going, to switch on our anti-slouching muscles and to help our mental capacity and our mood be so much better. So it really is worth noting, no amount of amazing ergonomic setup or expensive ergonomic chair can make up for any pain, strain or mental drain if you're not moving. So the movement is the key, I can't stress enough. So we've done our little movement break. Well, let's move on a little bit to setting up our screen and our laptop. Now, we don't have fixed monitors at home. You might have a station that's got a monitor and a hard drive and a fixed keyboard and mouse. Fantastic. If you do, you'll set up your screen height the same way we're going to set up our laptop in a minute. But many students, I go so far as to say most students, will either have a laptop or an iPad. Now, they're amazing because they're portable, but there is an, an inherent problem with the laptop scenario or the iPad scenario or anything where the screen is touching the keyboard. And the inherent problem is that either your screen is too low so that you end up looking down like this, or if you raise the screen, the keyboard's too high and the mouse is up here. So that's not good for you either. So the key really is to separate the screen from the keyboard and the mouse. There's not many ways around it, I'm afraid. So I've got some little accessories that I love to use that have just made my life so much better. I've got portable laptop razors that I love to take around with me. But you might not need a portable laptop raise if you and your student are basically set up at home in roughly the same area all the time. You might choose to use something very different. So this little portable guy raises my screen so that my screen can be roughly at eye height. Now, because of the angle of my computer, this it's not gonna look quite like it does on the screen as it does to me. But when I put my screen like so, the working height of my screen here is roughly at eye height. I could get it a little bit high, it might help. So I can raise it up to around eye height. Okay, 
So real high height for your screen height is amazing. Whether that's a monitor that you then make sure the top of the screen or the working part, top area is around eye height or a bit lower. You don't want it higher. The worst thing is to have your monitor too high or your screen too high because then we end up like this. And that puts a real uh, undue amount of strain on our neck. It's better to have a little bit lower so we can actually just look low, give it low. So we want to work below that eye height so that we can maintain a really good uh, supported posture and just look down as we need to go down the screen. Okay? Because we're talking about home setups, we're not, and for students, not, most students don't have multiple screens. So we're not going to go into multiple uh, consoles and screens and that today we just stick into the basics so we've raised our laptop our screen or our monitor screen our iPad screen you might use something very different to this portable laptop raise if you would like a link to that particular one I, will, I can provide that for you it's an amazing one the best I've found and so sturdy but you might find you use some books or a box or something that is, you know, just going to make create a platform for you to put your laptop on. Be careful when you are using those sorts of things to raise your laptop because you must make sure the vents are aren't covered. I've had one patient in my lifetime I remember after I'd even got him this portable laptop raise, he hadn't got around to using it, and he burned out his hard drive because he didn't realise the vents. Um, were covered and he had his laptop on a stack of books. You must check the vents aren't covered or your laptop will overheat. So we've done that, we've raised our screen, perfect. Now we really want to get some sort of separate keyboard so we can use our keyboard and a separate mouse. So it does take a little bit of getting things together to get your keyboard and screen separated for your laptop. And students wouldn't often do that around school or university, totally fine. But at least at school and university, they tend to be moving a bit more between classes, particularly school, moving between classes. They're not stuck for hours on end. It's the after school, uh, after year, after the study, home study time, where they tend to be stuck at, at a screen. And we won't get all into ergonomics of screen use today, but we'll talk a little bit about it. But they tend to be on those screens for a lot longer after after school hours. So it's even more important to have you set up right for after hours. And I would really suggest that you have at least one extra uh, keyboard and mouse that people can use when they're on their, their laptops for any length of time. It makes such a difference because you can sit and type in a supported position with your feet on your foot rest, back on your back rest, sitting and typing away, just looking around there, you've got your mouse in nice and close and everything's working amazingly as opposed to looking down and getting lower and lower in your chair. Your mouse is then often in the centre and so you get into this sort of rotated in position with your shoulder. So that is just a cheap little Bluetooth keyboard that I picked up at, at an electronic store, Daily Hi-Fi or OfficeWorks. And same with the mouse, nothing fancy. These are not ergonomic mice. I've never, I haven't come across a lot of students that need ergonomically specifically tailored mice. So that's in a conversation for another day if you think your student might need that. I like to keep the short ones uh, around home because we don't need excessive data entry number systems in the uh, length of the full keyboard. So the short ones are great because they're really portable. That's not linked into there, so I can just put that in my laptop case and take it all around with me. You might have ones that you need to plug into a USB. That is totally fine. Whatever you've got a hand, whether it's easy, cheap, and accessible, will be fine for you. But just keep in mind the longer keyboards, specifically when they're not really needed, tend to mean that your mouse ends up further out here, away from your body. I'm sorry that this is in the way today, but particularly you would want your mouse roughly if I turn face you around this height so your shoulder can stay in close to you and you can type here and mouse there. The further away your mouse gets the more your shoulder comes forward and then you tend to you see people like lean up to the side which puts a whole bit of asymmetrical strain on or maybe you even lean up onto the other arm or the other uh, arm on the desk and then mouse a bit like this 
And you can see what happens to the old neck and shoulders after you've been there for a long time and starting to get all squished up and stiff and sore. It's a recipe for disaster. So a short keyboard where you can keep the mouse in close is really nice for students if you're starting to scratch and purchase something. Purchase something that's not very expensive but just really common sense. So I wouldn't go getting the big keyboards if you don't need to. So we're pretty well set up here with most of what we need. We haven't really talked yet about where you put all your accessories, but just things within reach. You don't want to have to do lots of repetition of reaching and leaning for things into drawers and stuff. But having said that, students' bodies are really, they need a lot of movement and they're usually pretty supple and flexible and we want to encourage them to move a lot. So I wouldn't make it too easy for them to stay sitting at their desk for too long, especially if they're stuck on uh, computer games and something and getting engrossed in it and not moving. You might even have some discussions around how long you have timers on for or reminders on for so that they're encouraged and they understand why they need to get up and move a little bit more often for their brain health and their body health and also for their family health. I'm sure most parents would agree with that. So we've got that traditional setup going over there. Over here, I've actually got this is my sit to stand desk, so I'm saying, and my um, same sort of setup goes, but I don't need my laptop raised very much. Or I might put it over there just to raise it a little bit for me to have it a little bit higher, but we can go up and down as we need to. Now, one thing I did want to cover off before we go is talk a little bit about devices, iPads and phones. Now, I love spending time talking about this with students because they, well, they can work out how they tend to use their phones, whether they're symmetrical or asymmetrical and how they hold them. And we go through lots of ways that are really healthy and really unhealthy in terms of how we would uh, use our phones. We won't go into depth with that today. But with iPads, I get a lot of questions about iPads and books. So I haven't talked about books yet. But iPads are a tricky one. Mine's in my special case. But iPads are traditionally obviously a bit separated. And so the screen's like this. Some of them would be joined, like a Surface Pro computer or one of the iPads that's actually got the um, keyboard attached. They're often hinged. And so again, you have the same problem as a laptop. I would work out a way to have the, the iPad raised a little bit. Sometimes even we're talking about raises, um, recipe stands, or there's the IKEA tablet holders. They at least prop up an iPad. You usually would then need to put them up on some books, so they're actually a little bit higher. The, the IKEA tablet stands aren't usually high enough, but they do tilt it up a little bit higher than the case that comes with an iPad, the iCase. Um, but any sort of screen that comes like this, might, you may or may not have a pen with it, tends to be tricky in terms of how do we set it up ergonomically because we're often either got the keypad attached or no keypad and we're just using it like the tablet and we're hunched over it, okay? So I found, I searched the internet for quite a while to find this, but I found a case that I can put my iPad in like this. I can still use it as an iPad because I can put that like that when I want to use it as a notebook so I can just write on it out about but it also has this separate keyboard. Here, it's a Bluetooth keyboard so that I can put it up on a stand as well. So I can put that on my little laptop raise. I'd raise it a little bit higher if I was not using it for laptop, but using it for the iPad. And this little keyboard that comes with it is Bluetooth to my iPad, right? So, so good here. I can actually have my laptop I'll put it up as high as I can for you to show you, but it can be a little bit higher raised. If I was at my desk with this up, I often would have it up here. So I'll move it up a little bit higher if I was sitting at my sit to stand desk, and I've got my keyboard separate. All right. If I'm out and about and I've actually got it on my lap, it's not ideal to put the screen down, but at least I have the screen separate so that I'm not actually touch typing on here. I actually have 
a separate keyboard. I just wouldn't stay there for very long. Uh, if I was doing work on it, I would actually separate it, raise it up, and use the keyboard separately. It comes with a little um, Bluetooth keyboard. So I thought that was really nifty because it's a really great ergonomic uh, solution to using your iPad. And I'll take that on a plane or anywhere with me. And, and it's almost like my little, um, my little laptop. Or I can use it as a notepad, as I'm sure you know. So lastly, if we talk about notepads, and I should probably get out my little um, notepads here. Or I can use my iPad as my notepad, pretending it's my notepad. So students have books, and they have notebooks. Um, iBooks, lots of different ways of studying, folders, all sorts of things, and they work in different ways. So some people you like to have their screen still here and their books around them. Some people like to put have be away from the screen and have their books separately. It's a similar thing when you're using your books as to when you're using your screen. If you can tilt it up so that you can write on your book. It just helps raise it up towards you rather than you spending hours hunched over a desk like this, often crooked around and twisted to the side while we write. I'm sure you've seen lots of students do that or you might even know that you do that yourself. So it really is helpful, first of all, to educate the kids and pick up our habits. We're all guilty at times. But oh, and I forgot to bring it over with me. But if you have a ring binder, some of the old fashioned triangular um, ring binders that are high at the top and putting them down here, they can be really great to raise your books on. They're a nice firm writing platform. There's other little writing platforms that you can get that you can actually put on a desk if you're doing lots of note work for either writing or reading, reading lots of manuscripts and documents and things like that. Although students these days will tend to do a lot of their reading on their screens. Reading on your devices is, is great. That's sort of another, another topic that we go into deeply when I work with students themselves because they need to understand the mechanics of that. How are we going to hold our screen? How are we going to sit? Often it's in a bed on the floor. Da -da -da. So they really need to be empowered with that sort of information. But whether or not we're going to decide to hold it up, which we're not going to be able to sustain for too long, or whether or not we're going to prop ourselves up, so prop it up on our lap or sit up with our knees up bent, put it on there for a little while. As long as we're raising it up towards us and encouraging that we spend a little bit more time in a less strained position. And then because we're moving often, we're not going to be there for too long, remember. So we might need to put reminders on for ourselves so that we're not spending hours leaned off to the side in our bed, twisted like this. No, 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 we've got a reminder on there. We might only spend 10 minutes doing that before we go back to a desk situation so that we can raise things up. You might have your um, notebook up on a raise on a tablet stand so that you can read off that. Now, there is another little document holder that I have actually lent out to someone, so I don't have it. But it's called the Microdesk. And the Microdesk is amazing because you have your keyboard set up on the table, your laptop around. Oh, did we mention your screen is supposed to be about fingertip length away from you? I think I mentioned it earlier. So when you sit down in your chair, your screen or your monitor should be about fingertip length away. So that's how we need our deck on our desk. Getting back to the Microdesk. So if you have lots of papers around and you're constantly twisting and constantly going from side to side or leaning over or hunching, it's great to have something like the microdesk. I can put a link to it in the uh, notes where you would have it over here. It goes over the top of your little keyboard, but you put your uh, notebook, notebooks, textbooks, notepads on there so that you can actually read and write on that but still be able to type and look straight ahead and you can do everything all at once without the twisting. It's the repetitive, asymmetrical, leaning, twisting, all those things that we want to try and avoid so we can spend more of our time being more supportive and then move when we want to do our stretching, strengthening, getting ourselves out of that stiff awkward posture. We don't want to be stuck 
in awkward, twisted, asymmetrical postures for very long. We definitely want to just keep ourselves moving. So I hope that's covered off on quite a few things. I'm not sure, I can't see any comments coming through that you have any questions right now. But I will just quickly share a little bit about the Be Fit to Sit program that I do run in schools. If you've got kids in primary school or high school all around Australia, uh, I love empowering kids in their own classrooms, running these workshops with them where they decide what works for them based on the information that I've given them about movement breaks. Why would we do it? What would we do and what inspires you and how would you like to run a movement break? We do lots of fun things around it. And, and I give them lots of ideas. We talk about posture. So they actually are inspired to be wanting to improve their own posture. And lots of kids have actually told me, I went home and told my mum how to sit better in her chair and help take strain off her neck and back. Like that just makes me, my heart sing. I love to hear things like that. Where kids have taken on board something so well that they've actually gone home and told their siblings or their family members. How good is that? Rather than mum and dad having to nag them about their posture. And kids get to talk and feel what it's like to use their devices in a healthy manner and put some healthy boundaries and parameters around how they do that. And we do lots and lots of desk exercises, stretches, and targeted things that help them switch on their anti-slouching muscles and get them some strength and stability so they're actually more, uh, more empowered to sit really well for longer and then do really cool little movement breaks that are going to be really good for the body and really good for their metabolism so that their health benefits are long lasting and they're really developing these healthy habits that are setting them up for life. I'm so passionate about that. I don't think our students should have to wait till they're in a big office organisation after they've spent all these years studying, feeling awful in their bodies to work out and finally get an ergonomic assessment done when they're sitting for 40 hour plus hours a week. No, 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 no. Kids should know this stuff now so that they actually make the best out of the young bodies that they've got and keep them healthier for longer. I really think that that's important. But if your kids or your students at school would love that sort of uh, workshops and resources we do it for students, for teachers, for parents, it's really exciting and encouraging. We do some fun stuff. Uh, make sure you, uh, you reach out to me and I can get in touch with your school. But the most exciting thing for me is that very soon, in a few weeks in September, I'm going to be launching the students version of Be Fit to Sit. So it's an online course where students themselves can actually learn this stuff. It's going to be really quick little videos, but we'll go through step by step things about movement breaks for how why we do it, things about our postures and how we're going to set ourselves up for success and take strain off our bodies. How are we going to deal with strain when it comes? So I love teaching these kids, or well, let's stretch out tight areas, but let's use little trigger balls and massage things and stuff to actually deal with our own tight knots in our muscles. How can we do that? There's lots of really tricky ways that students love. It's so much fun. And also, you'll get them to do their own little economic setup so that they feel that they love where they're doing a lot of their homework and exciting stuff and, and their, um, their assignment work, sorry, after hours or their home learning environment. So when they set things up for themselves, sort of using simplified version of the principles we've talked about and they learn how to use their own devices really well, they are so much more likely to take that on board ongoing. And it's sustainable, healthy habits that we're after, isn't it? We really want our kids to know how to look after themselves and be equipped and empowered with those tools ongoing for the rest of their lives. They may not do the right thing all the time because we don't even do the right thing all the time. We definitely, I am definitely guilty of doing, uh, well, not the wrong thing, but in unhealthy postures and forgetting to move, all those sorts of things. But when I catch myself out, I know what to do. If I feel pain and strain, I know what to do. And these kids can do that too. Students know when they feel young, suddenly go, that's right, I remember that brain break I need to do, or I remember that stretch I need to do, or I know how I need to um, get into that muscle knot to help myself feel better. So the Be Fit to Sit Online student course is coming, uh, hopefully just in time, in a few weeks for those students who are starting to head into 
uh, exam period and, and that sort of stressful end of year um, period of, of sitting that can often wreak havoc on their bodies and their brains. So I would love to get that out in time for students to be able to do that. So there's two exciting things coming up for the Be Fit to Sit community. Workshops in schools and the online Be Fit to Sit uh, course for students. There's a family one as well, so mums and dads, you won't, or older kids won't miss out either, but the student one is really exciting because it's brand new and everyone will get a new exercise every week to do, a new little tip or encouragement or a bit of advice along with their breaks they can do every week just to keep them inspired, engaged and excited about how they learn to use uh, their bodies a lot better. So I think we have covered a lot of things that I wanted to in our little ergonomic uh, student workshop today. Would you like to do a last little workshop thing with me though? There's still a few people here and this is one of my favourite things to do with kids in class. When I did a, um, a series of lessons with primary schools earlier this year, nearly every class requested when they got to choose their favourite movement break, class break, everyone nearly, bar a couple of classes, wanted to do this little exercise and students were telling me that they did it with their siblings and their parents at home. So we'll see if we, you can do it with me here. So what I get kids to do is to stand up, so you can all stand up. It's going to be hard for me to stand up because I'm out of screen. So I will kneel down. So imagine I'm standing up. I'm actually going to split my legs into a squat. I'll move my chair out of the way. So we're standing up. Stand up with me. Let's get up and get our bodies moving. So we get up and we're going to do what I call finger sum slams. And what that means is we're going to put our hands behind our back. On your hand, decide how many fingers you're going to use for this round of the game. It is a game that you play with a partner. So you can play with me or you can grab someone else in your house and stand opposite them and play this. We play this in classrooms in pairs and it's heaps of fun. Stand opposite your partner or face me. And we're going to warm up our feet backwards and forwards in scissor jumps. And each round of the game, we're going to switch legs. All right, I'm trying to get down into the screenshot. So hands behind your back. Get your finger in the number. I'm not going to show you my number of what you're going to reveal. And if you're playing against your partner, they can reveal together. Or if you're going to play against me, I'm going to reveal my number on the count of three. So we're going to say finger, some slam, and then show your hands. And the first person to add them up is the winner. So I showed two. If you showed three, the first person to say five would be the winner. Do you get the idea? <laughs> okay, that's how we're going to play finger sum slam. And we're not going to slam anymore because that's empty code we're not touching. But you can just shout out the winner. So let's warm our legs and switch legs to the other side. Hands behind your back again. Get your fingers ready. Finger sum slam, show your hands. Five, what are you? Have you got some up? I can't see, so you, I can only assume that you've added up and said the number. It gets your brain working and your body. So let's get our legs moving again. Switch legs for the next round. Hands behind your back, but this time we're going to put them behind our head. So we give our arms a bit of a stretch. Get your numbers ready on your hand. Have you got your partner ready? Or if you're playing against me, finger slam, slam, show your hands. Four. So what have you added up? It's a really good mental maths game. We'll do one more switch legs for another turn. Hands behind your head, switch hands, finger sum slam, show your hands. Two funny years. So you shout out the first person to shout out the addition is the winner. But in older kids, we do it with multiplication. Sometimes we do it with subtraction, division, all sorts of things. It's a really cool maths game that kids tend to love because they love being in their pairs. Switching up, getting some movement, giving their posture a bit of a stretch when their hands are behind their head. And of course, the teachers love that we're doing some math skills and getting our brain switching on so that we're actually getting a little bit of learning in as we go. It's a really quick draw type game that really enhances their math skills, particularly when the older ones start doing it with two hands. So we only did one hand, but when you get tricky, two hands is definitely a winner for addition or multiplication. So much fun. I hope you've gleaned a couple of tips. I'll try and put some links in the comments later. Um, and if you've got any questions, especially if you're watching the replay, make sure you reach out to me. It's been great to spend this evening with you, teaching you a little bit more about student ergonomics. Well, some rough guidelines anyway, a very quick 
Ergonomics 101 for homeschooling, home learning and homework. And I look forward to hearing more from you, maybe even working with you in the online workshops or school workshops. I look forward to empowering you and your family to feel and function your best at your desk. So bye from me, Kim Siddons, the this workstation wellness physio. Bye for now. Have a great week, everybody. Ta-da.